Hey everyone, welcome to Punkcast. My name is William Maxwell. I'm a student of Web3 and the owner of Punk9527. CryptoPunks are 10,000 uniquely generated characters stored permanently on the Ethereum blockchain. No punk is the same. This is a show dedicated to celebrating the punks behind the punk. My hope for this podcast is that we capture the essence of the punk culture, elevate the brand and the individual behind the punk. One last thing. Projects discussed on the show is not financial advice. Crypto and NFTs are a volatile and risky asset class. Please always do your own research. Other than that, let's go. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Punkcast. Today, we're back with Punk2353 with three attributes. He's rocking a VR with purple hair and the icy silver chain. In real life, he's an art history graduate from USC and also an angel investor and entrepreneur currently building MetaStreet, a new and innovative lending protocol for NFTs. We should also note that he's also a major sponsor of our PunkDAO's Global Punk Brunches. Please welcome none other than the purple hair and Japanese onsen maxi, David Choi, to the show. David, how are you? Great. Thanks, Max. Uh, It seems seems like you know me quite well already, so... (laughs) Um, No, I I think uh, we've we've been able to catch up uh, in Seoul and, uh, and obviously trying to organize some of the brunches and stuff in the background so um and it's been good uh, working with you mate um it's great to finally have you on the show um maybe i could just start with the first question i know your handle is david Choi, but i think your actual handle on on twitter is ktk zergs what is yeah. that yeah oh that's that's just me when i was like four years old and playing starcraft uh, as a korean should um and then just being a uh, I don't know. We, we, it was like a clan that we created back old one, um, and yeah, I just ended up ended up keeping it. It was like me and my like other four or five year old friends, uh, and we just created that. There's a kitty kid protoss, kitty kid Terran, kitty the others. Um, so it's long history. It's, it's like a gamer tag, uh, and I my I, I pulled up Twitter again, and then I was like, wait, I have this. I should just use that. Um, it kind of evolved into I guess crypto. Um, and you know, in the early days of crypto, I actually didn't use Twitter uh, because I. Uh, for, from my understanding, you shouldn't have a target on your back, so I actually um, avoided uh, public uh, um, tension for the most part. So I kind of just started that back up after starting this company. Um, but yeah, nice, uh, super nerdy. I love it. Um, and then, and then maybe we could just have a quick chat around, I guess, your background and sort of everything, sort of pre crypto. Like, what were you doing, uh, and how did you sort of get into into what you're sort of doing now? Yeah. Um, so as you mentioned, I, I do have a degree in art history, um, focusing on actually the development of art markets in the 15th century Dutch markets. It was the first time like art was actually traded um, and as opposed to the you know northern, uh, this is like the northern Renaissance versus the southern Renaissance, the Italian one, where it's mostly commission based. Um, so you didn't actually have a market based ecosystem with like the Antwerp Bannerists and stuff like that. But um, I'll, I'll hold off on the details there. Um, but uh, I also stu- study finance too, and kind of the combination of which was my first job, which is actually giving loans against artworks um, in Upper East Side, New York. And that was kind of my first uh, like foray into the professional world. Um, thought I would do that forever, but you know, it's kind of a, it wasn't a great industry. Um, just kind of like um, a lot of like different ways to, it, it was a very emergent industry. So the, the place that you were doing was like pretty high interest rate based lending and stuff like that. Um, we're doing like Monte Carlo simulations to to price the sale at least back of an artwork. Um, essentially, a lot of fancy math is just say like 8 to 10% interest rate. Um, and the economics were like, were interesting. Um, but yeah, definitely opened my eyes to kind of like how that world worked. Um, and then I worked in investment banking after that at Deutsche Bank, um, doing um, real estate, like timeshares, old wood casinos, to like shopping malls, like all that, and different ways how the profit generators work. And it was also like other hard assets. So that, that's how it evolved. And I got into crypto in like 2016, 2017, um, in the early days of like gas bombing to get into ICOs, um, all the way to venture investments. Um, because venture didn't really exist before then. Um, it kind of emerged right after my 2018 era and ICOs. Um, and yeah, this kind of been in the space. Um, our, our CTO actually created one of the earliest the punk snipe bots, um, coded up for a friend who never actually ran it because he didn't know how to open up GitHub. Um, so it was buying a punk under a hundred bucks <laughs> and yeah, it never ran. He, he ran it for a little while and he, he ended up buying three punks that way. But that was like kind of the uh, um, early, early MEV or like proto MEV days. And yeah, just been an, uh, an angel investor since and uh, started uh, doing hackathons like mid 2021 um, as a personal interest and then started ministry right after that. 
Yeah, cool. And, and you, you said you were Korean. Were you born in the US or were you, uh, did you sort of, your family migrated across to the US later? Yeah, yeah. I was born in, I was born in Korea, but I moved to the US pretty early. Uh, my Korean's not that great, frankly, um, but uh, um, that, that is my heritage. Um, and yeah, um, lived uh, West Coast for most of my life and then East Coast for professional and now in Puerto Rico. Mm. And um, I'm, sort of, I'm sort of interested of all the, you know, subjects and topics you could have studied. Why did you pick art history? And uh, yeah, I was I was really into painting in, in high school. I actually got into RISD, and I was I thought I was going to go there, and then I did a campus tour, and then I realized I didn't actually like it. Um, and uh, art history is just kind of like um, I guess understanding human culture and like trying to understand visually like what the visual culture was. And visual culture actually appeals to me more than the actual art history because art history is like like he says, she says kind of studying, um, whereas visual culture actually studies like what we're actually trying to uh, visually comprehend and like uh, see in the world. Um, that That's what interested me um, from our artistic angle. And I had a minor painting too. Um, but I guess that was kind of the appeal to me, like what really drives taste for the most part, like in terms of distinguishing what is tasteful and what is not in society, um, which is a function of education according to Bordeaux. Um, and has evolved ever since because that was like a very 70s analysis. Um, and that that's always kind of um, appealed to me in terms of um, how society is structured that way because taste does drive a little bit of hierarchy. How would you describe somebody with taste or without taste? Um, usually, I mean, th- it's a very French 70s analysis, but, you know, Bordeaux says like it's de- determined ent- entirely by education. That's why like a second grade primary education teacher could have more taste and be higher in society than like a hedge fund manager who has no taste and like um because they just are more educated and more more uh more tasteful in terms of what actually is distinct in terms of high class or low class taste um so the, the ability to create distinction which is the name of the book um is what drives it it's kind of evolved ever since because education has increased dramatically and globally and that's why they call this like um taste has been socialized um so you can actually now it's, yeah when you say when you say education, are you talking more in terms of education around art? Because a, a, a presumably a hedge fund manager is you know yeah. pretty educated yeah. compared to a second second grade teacher or whatever it is, right? And in the literary sense, so if you're talking about like the education of a specific subject, which is generally in in, in the arts and the classics and stuff like that, they can't stand above in that, in that kind of territory. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's been incredibly socialized, and ever since that analysis, we, uh, there's kind of been like an, uh, an evolving definition of what taste exactly is, which is more specialization. Um, and then now, it taste is so socialized that people question like, does that even like um, is that even a factor in determining determining what what actually has had taste as opposed to just mimetic value, which is like you're just being early into things. And now you can have taste in even like keyboard clicks, right? Like <laughs> you can be very specialized and like have distinction and things that. Um, aren't necessarily classics in hip hop all the way to other things that aren't necessarily like the fine arts. Um, and that we've kind of evolved the definition of what art is. Um, and as a result, taste also has expanded. So in terms of the modern definition, what decides taste, um, it is just, um, it comes down to appreciation. It's not necessarily just education. It's like, how much more can you appreciate it for what it is, um, is my modern definition. Um, but in terms of what actually determines taste, I, <laughs> I have to kind of look into the modern modern diction and um, the the conversations today on what decides it in the you know, 2023. But um, for me, it is entirely like how much can you appreciate something for for what it is, and how much can you push the definition of what that uh, I guess um, the purpose is behind it. So if it's like for punks, like do you have taste in punks? Well, determines like when you know about the history and what the modern com- uh, conversations are and what punk should be. I think that's a very common conversation. Um, and being tasteful about that for what the identity should be um, is fully based on your appreciation of the underlying medium. Um, so I guess that's a, a very indirect answer in a no, sense. No, no, but. It's, it's, it's super fascinating, right? I think it's always a question at the back of my mind. Um, as, just, you know, as DJs are trying to be art connoisseurs now in the NFT yeah. space um, and commenting on, you know, what's good and what's bad. I, admittedly, I probably have the worst eye um, and rely on other people and sort of triangle it around. But there's some things that I like that might not might not be as popular. But um, it's always an interesting sort of question. Um, when, when you were financing these as a as a career, 
Um, what, what kinds of deals were you doing? Were they sort of large deals, one-on-one type artworks? Like, what, what? yeah, there. This was mostly in Upper East End, New York, um, and I was just an analyst back then. Um, but it was, it was, you know, it's like Warhols, Frank Stella's, uh, Robert Indiana's, um, and like trying to find the the pricing of these assets, which was just based on comps on Artnet, uh, which is very simple, easy to pull. Now, it's more about data clean, cleaning and looking at like what exactly the volatility is for these assets um, and pricing it into the future um, for what. Because it, uh, the sale leaseback is like a way to effectively remove um, um, the economic burden. Um, so you're selling it and leasing it back to yourself. And you, that's possible because artwork you can put anywhere in the world uh, and say it's being functionally used. Um, so you're actually, you actually are leasing it back to yourself. Um, so they do that as a, um, for, for tax reasons as well? Um, yeah, that, that, that's yeah. one of the benefits. Of, um, but then you have to price the option to buy back your own artwork, which is effectively way to price the, the underlying asset which is this why we create our own like art indices to like add into the Monte Carlo simulations and stuff like that but it was I mean it's just like a lot of fancy way of like kind of just coming to the same number um, um, so it, it wasn't super like uh, uh, accurate um, but I guess I guess when the data is that junky like nothing really is um, it's just based on the latest comps uh, and the present what, value what was the what was the size of the biggest deal that you were able to write back then um, back then, I mean, it was like, it was usually portfolios of stuff, like, you know, a bunch of Warhols kind of put together or, or a, f- a few Indianas. Um, and, um, I worked for a guy named Asher Edelman, um, who, uh, who was like an er- early corporate raider and like a pretty prominent like name in our world. Um, and, uh, yeah, there was just like a few batches and they were like, you know, they can be as normal sizing could be above like a hundred or 200 K for these assets. Um, but ideally it would be bigger, like 500 or up to two mil. Um, and then after that, like the pricing is less frequent. Um, so with less mark to mark, um, like less traded assets, it's harder to price these stuff, just like NFTs. Um, and, you know, NFTs trade way more than art. Um, so it's, uh, it's an easier problem to solve in our NFT world. Yeah, nice. Man, it's super fascinating. And I think, you know, when we're sort of talking through this, it, you know, and I'm sure we'll get onto MetaStreet at some stage, it probably seems like very relevant sort of history uh, and and sort of, um, skills that you sort of acquired over those years before you got to Meta Street, right? Around art, finance, and linking yeah. those bits and pieces. Um, and and you 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 sound like you got into Bitcoin pretty early in 2016, 2017. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you, for I, I bought Ethereum um, or ETH um, on on, I, on Coinbase. ICO. Yeah. Uh, ICO no, or, no, I wish. I, yeah, I I was still in college then. Um, but uh, uh, no, it was uh, it was it was just done. It was actually. Um, in the bathroom at Deutsche uh, because I, I, I love my job so much that I was there at 3 a.m. in the morning and I was like, I need to, <laughs> I need to put my money somewhere. Um, it was just after I paid like a lot of my student debt and I, I was like, I, well, I can't invest in anything because it's insider trade. I was in the investment division, so everything's insider trading. You, ca- you can't trade, uh, you can't trade equities, debt, triple over commodities. They're like, you can't trade that enough. I'm like, it's commodities. Like, <laughs> how can you inside trade this stuff? They're like, we discourage that. Um, so I was like, you know what? And then I was the currency is didn't really qualify, and I was like, "Do you know what a cryptocurrency was?" And they're like, "We have no idea." I'm like, "All right, guess I'm buying this shit." <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, it was it was kind of interesting too, um, because I've always had an interest in like emerging market private equity, and a lot of the discussions there in terms of disintermediating like uh, institutional voids. A lot of it comes down to payments and like trust, um, and that kind of technology interests me in the early days, um, and. Uh, um, yeah, and then ETH kind of just became a thing. And then I think the first ICO I did was like status ICO. And that was the biggest buzz of my life of like a first 2x. Well, it just happens. And, you know, I'm sure everybody remembers the first 2x or 10x. You're like, how is this, how is this real? <laughs> um, and then you got, kind of get hooked, um, which is um, I, I got like real. Yeah. Welcome to the casino. Yeah. Um, and and what, what what was your first NFT? Do you remember? Like, it was, actually, it, was a crypto kitty. it was a crypto kitty um it was uh the, one, one of the first um and you know it was clogged network um uh and yeah a lot of my friends were kind of making fun of me I'm like what are you doing like losing all that and i think i think i lost like 2k which was a lot back then um and still is today i guess in, in this market but um yeah it was just like a kind of like a funny experience and then I, i've you know the, i played a little bit with hash masks um when, when it kind of resurged and um you know, i was on and off um I wasn't necessarily degen trading like pretty frequently because I was just I I was kind of like kind of re- recovering from the DeFi era. So um, I think a lot of people in DeFi kind of like uh, 
I missed the NFT wave. They did a few things. Um, I'm in a few DAOs myself that like focus on NFTs, like uh, Pleaser DAO and, and a few others, um, and uh, kind of used that as my proxy exposure. Um, and yeah, I ended up owning. I, I bought two punks specifically in VR um, because um, I, uh, I I'm quite into VR uh, nowadays. Um, uh, because I'm, as, as you know, I'm a big gamer myself and I've been so bored with video games recently, uh, besides VR, because I think it's actually pushing like, um, um, uh, entertainment frontiers. Um, and it's actually a use for my graphics card because every time you get a new graphics card, you're like, what, what did this do again? Like there's reflections now, but when you use a graphics card for a VR set, you, you see the difference. You're like, wow, cyberpunk is like crazy here. What, what, what kind of VR are you using? Um, I'm using Quest Pro, but I'll always plugged in. You should never ever not plug it in unless it's a Vision uh, Vision Pro, maybe. But you, man, it's it's a different world when you actually plug it in uh, on Unreal Engine Five. You're like, this is this is a video game for sure, um, and it feels pretty phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I still I still need to make my way through to uh, getting to the VR. I had a had one of those. Uh, VR headsets for a bit of time, but I think I was just getting too much motion sickness from it, so I sort of gave yeah. That's that's the latency too. So if you plug it in, it, it disappears, um, and uh, then you can oh, play really? Skyrim okay. for like six hours. Yeah, um, <laughs> and then okay. yeah, the modding community is also really great too. It's a really small like community, but like um, it, it feels like early day StarCraft, early day like CSS at one point six. Um, and that's kind of why I like it. So, so does that mean you're bullish metaverse then? I guess the concept of metaverse and yeah, yeah, and three D spaces and yeah, I guess the concept of like digital worlds. Um, I'm already seeing that with like a lot of um, I guess like high school friends who just live entirely digitally natively. Um, even my brother's into like the K-pop world too, and that entire idea of like communities kind of just hanging out together on on Discord is like. For us, it's now familiar, but to a lot of people, that was really alien. Um, I, I remember I was hanging out on Skype with like my friends, and that was like the early way to hang out where Xfire. Um, so I think you're already seeing the early instances of it. We just haven't seen like the full immersion, and I don't think VR qualifies as metaverse. I think it was just a, when the internet becomes a place um, to hang out. Um, so that's a metaverse. And then I think when there's an economy, um, that's the driver of the metaverse. When you have like metaverse native labor and stuff like that. Um, um, which you're already starting to see. Yeah, gotcha. Um, you spoke about buying punks with VRs. When was your first punk purchase? Uh, my, mine was actually recent. So, um, like the a punk to actually hold, like you know, life punk was was really earlier this year. Um, I bought it from Backseats. Um, uh, I know some people in the community know him. Um, Definitely sold me for a high price, but it was worth it. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was it was specific. I was I was I was shopping around. I had bids like for for like really a year. I'm just trying to like, hey, like which one do I want to buy? I, I was I want I wanted purple hair, and then VR like kind of became a recent passion, and I was just shopping around for that for a good one. Um, and then finally got finally got a bid for that, um, and then ended up buying two. One's a bandana, one's uh one, one's a purple uh, purple hair. Purple hair just and VR just I don't know. It fits well together. Um, I think Daft Punk has a very similar one to mine um, as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I, uh, I sometimes get you guys mistaken sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like a Spider Man. It's like, yeah. Who, who are you? Uh, um, but um, what, what, what made you um, eventually want to buy a punk? Like, what was your sort of key, key driver? I, you know, my, my favorite story to tell is uh, before I even get there, is kind of like what it feels like to buy an artwork in Upper East End, New York. Um, and the first artwork you buy. The first artwork you buy is probably going to be like a Warhol. It's like, you know, classic, safe bet. Um, but, you know, when you're, when you're at these like gallery of events and people try to establish hierarchy, like say they have better taste than you, um, it's a very like toxic environment. Um, like, hey, I own a Warhol. Oh, you own a Warhol? Like, please, like, I don't know, Clay Soldenberg. Like, <laughs> what are you? Um, it's, it's like, it's not, it's not very nice. Like, they use it as a proxy to like pretend as if they have more taste than you. And it's very much, you know, it's, it's, it's a pit of vipers. Um, and, you know, when you say like, oh, I own a Warhol, like it's, it's not a good thing. And I, the word they use is called nouveau riche. It's a, it's a very toxic, like um, hierarchy establishing word. Um, but when you buy a crypto punk, there, you don't, you don't get called that. Um, but people in the community just like kind of accept you. And you're like, congrats. Like I remember I, I bought a punk and I told people and it's like the first time I crossed a hundred likes on Twitter, which was, a big deal to me but like that kind of like um like a bear hug um 
for one, by people who kind of been around. And it's, it's like a, um, a way to kind of access the community um, in a way that it's not just like, hey, you bought your way in. It's more like you really are part of the community. And people who might have been trying to like buy their way in end up actually becoming a member of the community and are like, oh, I actually don't want to sell this. You know, it's, uh, it's very sticky. Um, so it, it is like a anti-hierarchical community, which it, it's kind of like, it is different. Um, it, it does feel like a, a modern church in a sense. Um, where people just kind of come together and kind of like accept it. Um, and, and every time I have a brunch, like it, it just feels like um, I want to hear your story. Um, and most conference events, as you know, you're like, I, I don't want to talk to this guy. Like, what is he? But if he has a punk, <laughs> then I'm like, yeah, come on, man. Like, tell me, like, well, 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 how, how'd you get in the community and stuff like that? Um, and, you know, I, I didn't really feel that owning like a crypto kitty or these other NFTs, uh, especially because obviously like that was some early days stuff. Um, but, Definitely felt it when I when I owned a pump, which has a history, has an identity, um, and you know, it does feel lundy. Um, and I think it's closer to an artwork, ironically, to a P, than to a PFP, but has a community of a PFP. Um, so it was kind of like in that uh, Venn diagram. But yeah, how did you hear about punks, or did, did you have friends that had punks, or you just yeah yeah. Um, our, our CTO had punks, like a few from that snapbot that he built up, um, and obviously, kind of like. Um, he's kind of like proxy that exposure and I, I realized I should have my own instead of just like through <laughs> indirect reference. Um, but uh, it was, the community was kind of, it's been well known for a while. If you've just been around, you've heard of it. You've um, seen people talk about it and have it, ha- have it repped, um, you know, like the G monies and stuff like that um, in the early days. Um, and, uh, um, but at, at one point you kind of wanted to like really understand it. Um, and that's, I've, I've heard about it since, since the first mint um, because, you know, just, People are just talking about it, um, but in terms of actually being integrated, yeah, it's feels good. Nice. And um, you said you were shopping around for the purple hair and the VR from the get go. What's it about the purple hair and the the VR that uh, that you sort of love? Because it's it's this, it's the feeling of being in VR. It blew my mind when I did the plugin, and I'm like, I, I need to show that expression in, in, in an emoji. And purple hair, I think, <laughs> like your hair turning to like anime style, like that's that feels like a, a metaverse like <laughs> moment. Um, I, I I actually bought the bandana one first. It's like a, a vape uh, that has the blue end and then a blue bandana, which feels like you know very Ready Player One. It's like a deleted scene from the movie or like from it's actually from the book. Like he shakes his head and like just goes into VR. He goes to like I guess in cell mode, and I'm like. That's pretty much me, but um, but uh, this the purple hair kind of showed my emotions a bit better, um, and I look better. It just looks good. Um, so no, they're, they're cool. The purple pur- the pur- hair is probably one of my favorites too. Um, if money wasn't an issue for you, do, do you what what punk do you think would be uh, your first choice? Uh, this was my first choice. Uh, it just kind of represented my uh, I, I I wouldn't want a zombie. I, I don't I don't really affiliate with a zombie. That's not me. Um, or or I mean, of course, it's valuable. Um, but if money, like you said, money was an issue, like aesthetically. Um, uh, the other one that I actually wanted was um, uh, there was a scene from Black Panther. Another uh, one. Um, um, sorry. Uh, from uh, um, Black Mirror, um, where it was like the VR scene, um, and then like uh, one of the guys turns into a girl. And it was like that like character and I was trying to buy that. And actually I think it's very similar to the uh, one that was donated to um, uh, the muse. I can't remember which museum, um, but um, I think you could donate it. It was like a blonde hair VR one. Um, I kind of wanted a non a non male one because I think it's hard to stand out on like Twitter. I think some people have like a female um, uh, uh, character, uh, female character just because like it's nobody else like really houses it. Like if you're a guy, like you're another guy punk. Um, I think um, I'm trying to remember um, the guy started delegate um, delegate cash um, Lincoln Fubar um, Fubar 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 yeah um, he he also has, he rocks a, a girl punk Tiara and I'm like Tiara mm. yeah which mm. looks pretty sick um, so yeah. that's like something I, I would consider rocking um, and also just kind of like um, obviously th- there's natural bias in terms of like the distribution of like um, 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 race and and gender in the crypto community. Obviously, it's mostly guys uh, as you go to most events. Um, so, in terms of keeping the the floor up, that's just the natural mis- misalignment in terms of you know what was actually like represented versus who are who are actually in the community. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I think buying those floor pumps is actually a cool, cooler thing to rock than more offside ones. It's kind of like um, yeah, it's kind of like you know getting a a, a breeded dog or just you know, 
getting a dog that um that is available so same thing yeah um and if you were to look across the punk community do you have like a favorite punk or series of punks that you um that you like or worth mentioning in the punk community um well g money i think um i think he just did, he did he did a lot for the the space in the community um so I have a lot of respect for that in terms of just kind of elevating the uh um the punks community um what else um i think seed phrase it was pretty legendary when he bought the seven trait like i think that was a great floor like oh i have a floor punk oh dude i have the ceiling punk you know <laughs> like, <laughs> i was like um so and just kind of like ha- how they've kind of been uh, uh perverse just like not only being the community but, but kind of being leaders um which i think is like pretty respectable um and yeah i guess um those are like good punks and i think it's just a shout out to all the other like builders in this space. Um, that's like probably the biggest reason I didn't mention earlier. Like punks are like, they do do stuff. Um, they, whether it's for the punk community, like um, I think like Nift, Nifty Abe, like just made this website that like is awesome for punks um, all the way to just like hosting events. Um, that was the first thing I noticed. I, I was like at, uh, um, uh, at Bogota. And then I think uh, Rick Latona just hosted an event. Like, yeah, punks, let's meet up. Um, and it just uh, ended up like coming about like the initiative that I see in this space um, and, and not space, but this collection specifically, um, I think is, is kind of unseen. Like it's ha- having like agency and initiative is pretty rare to see. Um, I think a lot of other uh, collections, people just kind of follow. They kind of expect that some <laughs> like the, the creators just do it. Um, but, you know, uh, fortunately for us, we think God is dead because um you know <laughs> the founders of punks are like yeah i mean they're not really pushing the, the content anymore um maybe yuga but like agency comes back to us as, as who we are um and uh i think all the builders kind of own it um you know kane owns one and stuff like that um so it's uh so geez yeah i think you're right i think it's uh it's a good signal if you're a builder and you're serious about web3 to be rocking a punk um yeah. it just signals a sense of legitimacy and authenticity to be in the space in some ways, right? Um, be among those people. Um, and how would you describe punk culture? Maybe you've touched on a little bit already, but like, yeah. would you describe it any differently? Uh, yeah, I, I think I'll just echo back to what I was saying earlier. I, I think I think it is a builder's culture. Um, it's uh, it's it's one of like true believers. Um, like punks never die, kind of thing. Um, it does stand out significantly to other like NFT collections. Like it's people who've kind of. They're not. They're not really trying to show off. I guess, in a sense. Um, funny enough, like uh, uh, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't ever use the word nouveau riche. Um, but that's definitely not what what they are. <laughs> um, they're really here just to have like kind of a good time um, and just kind of share like what they're doing and like just chat um, and actually have like a human connection. Um, uh, whether and you know you see in the Telegram, I think that's pretty unique too. Like it's predominantly a Telegram chat. It's not a Discord chat where people. I mean, of course, there is a punk's Discord, but the Telegram chat, like people just kind of like. They kind of get it, and there's enough like they're they're self organized enough that they don't need to have the 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 channels be organized for them, and they just kind of let let the stream, um, and it just becomes a continuous feed. Um, so that's and that, that that is something I I do appreciate the Telegram yeah, chat. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the best part. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I think I think when you're sort of talking through, I think you're probably right. I, I do feel comfortable in the punks community. Uh, it just feels a bit more. Um, grounded the conversations that we have the interactions that we have um conversely i think we were sort of talking about the traditional fine art world presumably that's very very different i mean i haven't had much exposure to it other than going to a few art basils and things like that um and just trying to have a conversation with some of these people i just can't connect with them they're just like on a completely different planet um almost feels a little bit superficial in some ways um it is you know yeah I mean, a lot of them don't even understand it. They're just like, yeah, I heard, I heard it's valuable. So I, I like the color. <laughs> like, they, they don't understand what the purpose was or like or the history of the artist and stuff like that. I mean, a lot of them do end up getting educated, but a lot of them just use it just to move up the ladder. All right. So maybe we'll have a quick chat on MetaStreet. Um, what was your inspiration for MetaStreet? How did this all come about? Yeah, um, I guess the primary start could actually start with um a major event with with punks um, which was 650d um selling for that collection in sotheby's um end of february 2022 
And this was like, you know, he you know, he was looking for liquidity and um, we kind of started ministry around then as like a, initially a, as a DAO, just kind of blending in the space um, to kind of get a feel for the market. Um, nothing was built around then. Um, you know, it was, it was ministry DAO in, in the beginning. And then, um, you know, 650D um, pulled out of the sale because, uh, you know, we gave him an offer like, you don't need to sell this. We'll, we'll give you a loan. We have the liquidity for it. Um, so we gave him a loan instead. And, you know, you pulled out and obviously you got bought the IP right after. Um, but the transaction was very, it wasn't great. Um, so, so well, what's, what's 650D? Zero uh, 650D. He was the owner of the 104 CryptoPunk uh, collection that was trying to sell in South Abuse. Um, uh, okay. And, yep. Yeah. And that was kind of like the big like punks event. Um, and then I think it, it got canceled and it was kind of a big deal uh, around then. Um, and uh, yeah. And, and, but the thing is when you, when you do like very large structured loans, um, you can't just give somebody a loan for a year. Right. There's, there's risk in terms of like, uh, the longer duration it is, the more risk there is over a period of time. So just giving like a one-year loan isn't so simple. It's like the most we could do is like kind of giving money to a friend. You wouldn't give him money to a friend for a year. You give him for a week, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, I mean, I give him money, you kind of get, get, give it back um, in that sense, even though it's collateralized. Like collateral can move up and down. Um, so this kind of like presented a problem. Like how do we scale debt? Um, and this this is... This is like how economies are built. And that's kind of our motto is expanding the GDP of the metaverse or expand the GDP of crypto punks. Um, like that is how you scale like credit worthiness and you can actually increase purchasing power. And our goal was like, how do you change the calculus in punk ownership? Where it's not about, hey, I need to borrow to get liquidity and use that money for somewhere else. You get to a point where you can borrow for so long that it's not about what you're going to do with the money. It's more about, hey, is punks going to appreciate more than the cost of my borrow? And if it is, I should always have it for borrow. And that's like how the US economy scaled. Um, this is actually how it happened in 1930s, like with, uh, with a mortgage. Um, it was liquidatable. You, could, you owned a house, the bank could call it any time. It was a 50% loan. And then, you know, they invented Fannie Mae or FMA, um, which created ways for you to have a long, un- unliquidatable long-term loans. And the US housing market has been on a bull market since, well, for a century now. Um, because of that long-term structure and, and like, and there's other components to it too, but that was kind of like the gist of it. Um, anyways, um, 650D wanted liquidity. We couldn't do it. And he's like, okay, we're doing this for 30 days. And he used it liquidity. But then after that, he didn't want to do it anymore because, you know, this overhead stuff, you, you, you kind of, it's kind of scary to like press a button every 30 days. Like that's usually the longest loan you can probably find. It's like after 30 days, you're like, you have to roll it over. And if you forget, I mean, you lose a lot of money. Yeah, you lose your stuff. Um, so, so we looked into like how how do you structure this so it's incredibly long term and it's incredibly scalable. Um, like it, it can keep on getting more and more liquidity. Um, and bilateral loans, um, it works in the beginning, just like Lending Club did in 2012. But and Lending Club had 250 thousand lenders when they at the at its peak. Now they have three. <laughs> they have three lenders on the entire platform because what happens is that um, it's not about the platform and how, how good it feels. It's about how much it costs and how long it is. Um, and the cost of capital, as they call it, has to come down because that's, this is a numbers game. It's not a UX or UI game. Um, and that's kind of what, what Metastry kind of, kind, of, kind of came about. It's like this big deal that we did, but we realized wasn't a good transaction. It was very, there was definitely a match to be structured, but this required a lot of, like, a lot of tech, a lot of financial engineering. Um, and that's what we built. Um, what we did was what anybody else uh, does traditional, which is you make the debt tradable. Um, and that's kind of our technology. Um, you have to do a few other things, like you have to cut it up, but I'll, I won't get into details. Like you have to like make sure that it stacks and then the risk is isolated. Um, but generally the idea is that you, by making that a tradable, um, then you don't have to liquidate the holder um, every 30 days or you don't have to uh, come back to it because the debt can trade at a premium to a discount. Much like when you're buying U.S. Treasury bonds, you're buying 95 cents to the dollar, and it matures to a dollar. Um, here, it's one to one the debt, and then it matures to maturity. So we actually use a lot of um, LSD fi technology or liquid staking derivatives. You know, pre-merge thief. Um, I'm sure the audience understands. Like, um, it was before there were rewards, um, but you can still trade it. Um, and that LSD fi is kind of like the big narrative today. We use the same technology for that to kind of open up long, di- long dated tradable debt. For punks, which um, really solves a very interesting problem. Um, so all in all, <laughs> what MetaStreet does is that we try to increase protections for punk borrowers, get, get better terms as many possible, 
make sure that they will never lose their punk when they need liquidity. Um, that's what we do specifically in terms of output. In terms of the tech, I can go, I can go on about it if you, if you ask more questions about it. But the, for the most part, the idea is, how do we make this scalable? How do we make it longer? How do we make it so that you don't lose value when you default your pump um, without liquidations? No, it is interesting. And maybe one thing that you could help explain is, um, I just had a quick look at some of the, the notes. Um, you've got reference to automated tranche maker, yeah. ATM. What, what, what is part, that? That's, there's a lot of interesting tech that goes behind this. And um, the, we have a lot of materials if anybody wants to review. Um, so the automated tranche maker um, makes it so that as Oracle as um, stackable debt, um, kind of like a, um, so that multiple people can co-participate. That's that's all it's that's all it does. Um, this, the tranching just means like people with different risk appetites can co- cooperate together to create a single loan. Um, and against that, against against a against a single asset, right? Against a single asset or against multiple assets. Um, it's flexible. Um, but before, like like again, it's P to P. If it's a friend to a friend. Um, you know, a bank, yeah, then it's it's very, very competitive. If it's one bank to one borrower, um, the bank's not going to give you a long-term loan, which is why the bank, like, you know, he, they reprice the debt and then they, you know, resell it and make it tradable. That's what they do. That's how mortgages work. Um, and that's kind of what we're doing now. It's like we, we create this tranching system so that multiple people can come together and provide the loan together. And then they have different risk positions. Um, and let's just, let's just call it like low risk and high risk. Um, and high risk gets more yield, but it's the first one that was hit if they default, right? Um, and uh, the bottom tranche is like much safer. Like those are people who are like, you can even put into stable coins for this kind of yield because they think it's good collateral. Um, but, you know, this, just like a uh, stake deep, it rebases like the, these, uh, these positions. So, you know, bottom, bottom tranche is decided um, what the rate is. Like if the loan's up to 30, somebody takes zero to 15, somebody takes 15 to 30. Um, and you know, punks is worth 50 right now. Thing is, if punks goes down to like 20, which would be horrible, um, then the top tranche is hit first. Um, and then the bottom tranche actually still gets paid. They, they still get the yield. Um, but this means that people who previously didn't want to give a high like risk loan, um, which is the only way you can win loans, right? Um, can now go to participate. So more, that more and more people come together and the more and more people that come together, the lower the cost is. Um, but yeah, ATM is just a way to bring more people to cooperate on a loan and change the economics of what a P2P arrangement is because a P2P is very much a PVP experience. Um, and yeah, by cooperating, um, and this is the most interesting thing because these positions are tradable, the low risk and high risk, you can short the top. Um, and, uh, that's the most interesting thing is like if somebody does have a, a position that like, I don't actually think it's going to stay up um, at 50, you can actually short the top. Um, so you can short that risk position because these are tradable. Um, a lot of the early product market fit for uh, stake deep was actually people shorting uh, Lido Steve because they're like, the, the merge is never going to happen. Uh, let, let, let's short it. And then uh, it, it would actually like dip down from par. It's trading 90 cents to the dollar. And then it pumped way back up because it does work. Um, so that those kind of like risk exposures happens much like somebody who's living in Ohio, they live in a house. They're like, they don't know some guy in Nepal shorting, uh, the triple C like a uh, mortgage, um, like package, right? Like all this stuff happens in New York and the global financial ecosystem. Whereas the house owner, he's not going to get liquidated because some Zillow index goes up or down. He just stays in his house, pays his rent or his mortgage, um, and lives his life. Um, and much like that, I want to make sure that punk owners never get liquidated, um, that they never, and if they do default, they actually get all their money back. That's a big difference with our platform. It's like, if there's a profit given default, like, um, you get a loan for 30, but it's worth 50 and it sells for 48, you get 18 back. Um, what, um, what, 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 do you know what the current rate is, um, and typical LVR out on a, on a punk would be? Yeah, you, know? you can. You, it depends on the duration for the LTV, but the interest rates are pretty pretty par. Um, it's actually par, uh, kind of the reason we're kind of the reason why it's so low because originally when we started it was 60, 50 percent interest rates, and then we actually lowered the interest rates by being ninety percent of the volume of the punk loans with this DAO that we had. Um, uh, and we're we're doing the loans on top of NFT five. Oh, so you're um, actually are you actually providing liquidity to the the, the different the platforms? Pools. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So we're we're very much a structuring business. Um, we're not necessarily just origination. We do have origination um, for like extra benefits, but um, that's um, that's not 
that's not necessarily like our our forte. Um, we're very much like how do we lower the cost of debt, and that's, this is this is exactly the question that I can answer. It's like how much does it cost to borrow? Well, I'll tell you. Um, well, you, we uh, by increasing secondary liquidity, you can actually increase um, because more participants can come in. Um, people can buy punk bonds on Uniswap now. That's kind of like the answer. You can own a punk bond, and that's the product that we created. The, tr- the ATM produces this, um, where you can create these bonds, and by owning a bond just on Uniswap, minting it, or whatever, you're supporting the punk community. Um, and that's kind of like so, the main... So is, is one punk bond one punk, or...? No, is it it's, it's one ETH. Yeah, one, one okay. punk bond is one ETH. And then uh, as loans pay down, that ratio of one, one ETH to one punk bond goes up to 1.1. Um, it rebases. Um, and like I said, LSD, FITEC. Um, and yeah, so the, right now the rates are 10% interest rate is about, about par. Um, it's like where most, it's, yeah, it's, it's good for the bar, right? Um, it's really good for the lender because I'll tell you, you can't beat 3% when you're in DeFi. There's nothing that beats stake deep. There's maybe perps or like Uniswap LPing if you're really savvy, but nobody beats 3%. And, and for the punk bar, like, wait, 10% is pretty good and because um you know real estate has always been um higher rates because it's more liquid um whereas um you know securities lending or like liquid lending is not very very high money markets yeah and, and so would the loan be based on um a certain fixed lvr based on floor or is it based on trait <laughs> It's it's on present floor. Um, the trade components um, requires a little more sophistication and more liquidity, um, and that that's probably going to come through right now. It's actually probably better to go through a P two P platform for a trade based loan if you want to get higher LTVs. Um, but um, if you want longer duration, um, like and really high scale, um, the floor assets are the most obviously the most reliable. Um, and it's because from the lender's perspective, like in a in a true like liquidation event, like really bear, like it doesn't matter like. Uh, you want to <laughs> yeah. yeah. You want out, yeah. Um, um, yeah. Gotcha. Uh, so, so, like right now, say, say for example, the floors uh, fifty. Um, what's the current LVR that uh, the protocol would generally lend against? If it's Is if it? it's thirty days, it's probably closer to ninety. It's pretty stable assets. Oh wow. Uh, yeah, okay. you get ninety percent for a thirty day, and for one year, you get seventy percent. It's still yeah. very high. Um, yeah, and, that's uh, a little bit a little bit risky. I mean, yeah, okay, but it's there if you if you want to take it, I guess. Yeah, I mean, um, it's riskier to take a short-term loan, actually, because you could forget. <laughs> and you'll be like, oh, I'll lose it. I mean, you still get the proceeds, um, like the value of uh, after interest, but you don't want to lose it. Um, I, and that's why 30 days is like riskier. But if you do one year, it's like doing taxes once a year. <laughs> like, you know, um, and it's riskier for the lender, which is exactly why I make it tradable. Because, you know, it's, it's, they're, they're in a year-long parking lot. They're like, how do we get out? Well, you can just trade out. Um, because... Yeah, exactly. And that's all that. There's no liquidating the borrower out of nowhere. You can rest easy, you know, just like taxes every April 15th. You're like, let's roll that over. <laughs> um, and that's all you need to do. And, and, and as the borrower, is it um, just a lump sum at the end of the term or is it like monthly? Including interest. Yeah, no, no, yeah. no, no monthly. It's a yeah, zero coupon. Um, and yeah, it, it, you can imagine because as long as there's liquidity, it no, learn, it no longer becomes what should I use this money for? It, the only thing, because it's so easy and there's no liquidation risk, there's no uh, default risk is minimized um, and all these other things. The calculus changes from what should I use my money for to do I think punks will increase greater in price than how much I'm borrowing, like the cost of borrow. Um, so it's like, oh, wait, punks, I'm borrowing for like, I don't know, like 10% a year and it's the LTV is 70%, so 7%, right? Um, that's how much the value, that's how much I pay. But if punks goes up by 10% over the next year, I should always borrow <laughs> uh, because you're getting a free carry um, and you can do whatever you want with it. Um, you don't actually ever need to pay down and it becomes better math. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe the bet as well is like, do you, do you, is there a bet that Bitcoin and ETH would sort of pump harder over the next 12 months? Yeah, well, you would get that exposure too. Um, yeah, assuming that it maintains, uh, you know, it's low beta against ETH. Yeah, but provided that it it, it outperforms whatever rate you're paying. Um, yeah, that could yeah, be we we, mm. we had a borrower using just thirty day because he's more sophisticated who's been on borrow for two years straight. 
And I don't think he has any intention of being back <laughs> ever. <laughs> is he got size or is he? Yeah, size. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's quite yeah. a bit. But just because he's, you know, he's, uh, he's savvy yeah, he, and you know. yeah. And he understands like, wait, but it's even easier from that. Instead of rolling 12 times a year, he just does it once. Mm-hmm. Um, he's like, wait, but then I'm, I'm always exposed and I can use his money for other stuff. I can even sell it to US dollar and use it for like life stuff because I don't need to pay it down. I just need to roll it over. Gotcha. And so what, what sort of differentiates you from MetaStreet from the other lending protocols out there, like Blur, Nifty5, Lendow? Yeah. I, um, so we're, we're integrated on, on top of NFT5, Arcade, and X2Y2. Um, we're not integrated on top of the Peter Pool platforms um, or Blur um, because, of the liquidation, because of how they liquidate their, their users. We only build on top of non-liquidatable um, platforms. You can't wake up one day and you're like, oh, shit, it's an auction. Um, that's that is impossible. Um, we never want that experience for a punk holder. Um, and the 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 thing that we create is that we create these things called punk bonds. Um, we create bonds um, so that if you want to support, if you don't want to do all the labor involved with giving an individual loan, you just want to be like, I want to own, own this punk bond. Um, then you can buy that on Uniswap. You can mint it, and, and that's kind of like the main platform difference is that we're kind of structuring that liquidity and we're tricking, uh, we're structuring that yield. Um, that's kind of a result of this like ecosystem that's been made, and we're taking that yield and bringing it to other people. Um, that's what our platform really does, um, and we're doing this so that it's better and better rates uh, for punk holders. Um, so we're we're more rates guys, like we're we're more about structuring. We're not necessarily about doing your individual loans. We have that available because people have asked us, um, but very much so. Like what we're really good at is uh, the financial part. Um, and we make it easy, really easy to buy and have exposure to this industry. So if you want to have good yield and you really believe in punks, well, you should probably take the high risk, high risk bond because you're like, it's not going to go down. Um, and all these financial applications as a result of this punk bond, because this can, st- you can plug the stuff into DeFi. Like you can short it long and you can do collateralizations. Like one, one idea with like collateralizing on Ajna, which is like a new like borrow platform um, and stuff like that. So we're creating, we're really taking punk bonds and we're kind of separating the financial value with the cultural value. The financial value, you can do whatever you want with it. Trade on L2s if you want. But punk should never be on LR2. It should always be on LR1. There's, there's no point putting a punk on LR2. Um, but, yeah. That's cool. Um, and maybe just a couple couple questions before we sort of close out. But um, of all the collections that you sort of chosen as well, like it feels like you, you've specifically leaned into punks. Like what, why is that for MetaStreet? Um, punks, well, for one, it was, we, th- we, we did a lot of the, uh, a lot of the calculus in terms of the, uh, the data behind these assets and punks were just, well, first off, it was very lindy, like very long. Um, it's very few that are this long. Um, this is more from a financial perspective why MetaStreet does it because there's uh, more celebration than anything um, personal. Um, and yeah, it was just the most reliably stable asset. It was like incredibly like, uh, um, Incredibly related to ETH, um, so it's kind of like level long ETH exposure in a sense. Um, and a lot of the, a lot of the volume today comes from punks for like uh, debt volume. So we're like, okay, we should probably service the largest interest, uh, largest category. Um, and uh, we do we are supporting punks in where where we can because, like I said, like we're trying to lower the cost of capital for um, punks. Like the economics behind a punk, should, if you if you make credit better, then obviously. Um, becomes more credit worthy. Um, so that's why we're also co-hosting the punks bunches globally because we do think punks are very different. Even Jason, you know, the guy who says like quit quit crypto and go to AI, he even posted like, yeah, punks are actually pretty cool. <laughs> After he said that, <laughs> it's like, no, it's not crypto, it's it's punks. Um, and yeah. uh, they they do stand like in very very differently to the rest of uh, everything out there. It's very much an artwork, and it's been a very a far superior one than a Warhol, I'll say. Um, and yeah, the community is very strong. The identity is very powerful, and I, I think um, the this, it, there's there's no financial analysis which would show like how resilient these assets are. Um, besides just understanding the community, um, and we're trying to help like foster that. Like that's why we're like sponsoring all the brunches because that that is part of our um, purpose as a very large subsidization vehicle for punks, <laughs> um, because that is um, that is kind of our mission: just to expand that GDP. Punks. Awesome. 
Um, I'll have to sort of experiment with um, MetaStreet uh, soon as well. But um, but this is super fascinating, and thanks for sharing. Uh, I guess your story about MetaStreet as well, and looking forward to what happens next for MetaStreet. Um, a couple of rapid fire questions before we sort of close that close out. Um, how do you feel about V1 punks? V1 punks controversial. I don't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I'm not going to talk about Middle East either. If, you, if that's the next question. Uh, what, yeah. what about the um, the Yuga acquisition? How do you feel about the Yuga acquisition over CryptoPunks? I think it was I think it was a smart play by Yuga. Um, I think obviously community is pretty contentious about the purpose. Um, I think um, Yuga has well listened to the request of Pops, which is don't do anything, don't try to like push things, like do like very soft things. Like I think uh, um, Daniel was saying, like he was trying to push the artistical value. Um, I'm saying they're they're way more better than artistical value uh, per my um, uh, our historical comp, um, but. Uh, uh, I think they're doing a pretty decent job, actually. Um, just trying to not trying to turn into a video game, not trying to do anything about, about it, trying to really respect the community. Um, and I think it's, I mean, the alternative is bad owners, and they're actually being pretty, quite good owners. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, and if you could pass on a message to the next owner of your punk, 2353, what would you like to say to him? Um. Well, we should uh, play a game of Pavlov on in VR. <laughs> so I'm sure he has a, he has a Quest Vision Pro at least uh, by the time I sell it, and if I ever do. Um, that one's kind of like my life punk, though. Um, but yeah, uh, that's we should, we should at least be be friends on Steam. That's that's a requirement. <laughs> but yeah, oh, fantastic. David, this is super fun, mate. Thank you so much for uh, your time on Punkcast today. Um, any sort of final closing comments, and what's the best way for people to find you? Um, you can find me on, as you said, KTK Zerg. So that's, that's my Twitter. Um, our company is MetaStreet XYZ um, on, on Twitter. Um, we'll be doing a lot of like cool content around punks, sponsoring events. You can see it at most punk brunches going forward um, and, and, and events that are related to it. And we'll be we'll be there and are around. Um, we'll, we don't have to talk about business, just like kind of like understanding how we can support a wider community around there. Like if you're building anything interesting punks, like more than happy to collaborate um, in terms of uh, getting the word out. Um, because we just want to be part of the community. Um, and uh, in terms of closing comments, um, I, I mean, I, 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 anybody that's building cool stuff, just let me know. I'm, I'm personally interested, and hopefully we're also building cool stuff that you would appreciate too. That's it. Perfect. Dave, thanks again. And guys, that wraps up an episode of Punkcast for the week, and we'll be back next week with another punk. Bye for now.